Hello. Thank you for coming. I'm going to keep my water closed. You're going to have to bear with me. Um, getting over a cold at the moment. Um, and uh, that's what we're going to do. Also, it's my first time in Montreal. It's actually my first time in Canada in general, which is crazy. Um, and it's a beautiful city here. So, as mentioned, uh, this talk, I was thinking about you know, what I want to talk about to such a broad audience. And uh, I came up with a, kind of a BuzzFeed style uh, 14 lessons um, that I finally understand, that I did not learn at the time. And this is from people who I very much value, who are mentors in my life, um, and who I you know, continue to talk to and, and reflect um, on my journey. Uh, this title doesn't match the title on the front because it changed a bunch of times, um, but we're going to get through this. So, actually, let me back up for a second. Um, so, as a kid, I kind of always went my own way. I was forced to. I was born and raised in the south side of Chicago. Um, my mom uh, worked two jobs and uh, took care of my brother, my younger brother and I. Um, and so, you know, I kind of had to figure things out on my own. Um, I was never very good at school. And I was thinking about that actually when I was preparing for this, you know, why, why was school not really for me? And um, it's probably just I just wasn't very good at it. But I remember when I was younger, um, first grade, second grade, I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I always sat in the back of the class. I could not see the whiteboard, regardless of where I was. But that's not something I talked about. And I remember one day I was, I was with my mom, we were driving, and I asked her, I said, you know, wh when she's driving, we're driving down the highway, how can you see the signs before it's too late, right? Like I couldn't, I didn't understand that. And that's when she realized, obviously, I didn't have very good vision. Um, and so, uh, you know, throughout school, I always just kind of stayed back didn't pay much attention until about sixth grade when I finally got contacts um, and still didn't do very well in school. But my, my greatest trick um, when I was growing up was convincing my mom that I needed a computer uh, to do better in school, right? To do homework, to, to, to get better grades. And of course, naturally, I spent most of the time both playing video games on the computer and actually teaching myself how to code. And so naturally, I ended up in engineering where you know, I figured out very early that you can build things without people's permission. You can build things, give it to your friends that, that people want or they enjoy playing. And I knew that that was what was right for me. Right? So with some of these things, they're going to have a little bit of emphasis on programming and on engineering in general, but hopefully they are generally applicable. So real quick, let's uh, just go through my, my history. As I mentioned, well, regarding school, uh, I went to Purdue for about a semester. Uh, I dropped out, um, not surprisingly, uh, because I was lucky enough to be offered a job uh, in the video game industry. So um, I moved out to the West Coast uh, where I started working on console video games, Xbox, PS2, things like that, and uh, where I learned a lot from my first mentor. And I'll briefly go through this really, really quickly. Um, after that, I ended up in Namco, which is another video game company. But one thing I, I also kind of had a, um, I was self-conscious about even though I was a programmer, even you know, five years in the industry, was that I felt like I, I actually was not an engineer, right? I didn't have that degree. I didn't, you know, how do I call myself an engineer? And so being accepted to a place like Google and being lucky enough to, to get in there was huge for me because it was, you know, I felt as if, okay, finally I can call myself an engineer. And so with that, I wanted to learn as much as possible, right? I always had the desire to prove to myself that I was good enough or that, that I could be an engineer. And then I ended up at Medium, where I learned a lot from people, well, from Ev Williams, who's you know, one of the co-founders of Twitter and runs Medium, and then, of course, Square with Jack Dorsey. Um, and then I went on and started my own company um, called Secret that was a wild ride. Um, to put in context, this was a company that uh, you know, I'd started, built a little app, put it out there. Three months later, it blew up in, in, the, in the tech scene, and within about two weeks of launching, we had been offered term sheets uh, for a Series A uh, to the tune of $20 million at a $100 million valuation, um, which is insane. It's just, it's, you, you don't even know what to do with that. Um, and we had three employees and about 50,000 users. Um, but it was, it was very popular. It was in the press, and that's kind of what pushed that along. In the end, we ended up raising about $36 million 
at $120 million valuation throughout several rounds within six months, and then we shut down six months later. That's a whole other story, though. Uh, so I then went back to Medium, worked with Ev again, started my next company, did not have the same effect as, as Secret. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a good lesson. And then I, we were acquired by Postmates, where I am today. Okay, so I'm already way slow on time. So let's keep going. There's a couple people that um, I'm going to highlight some lessons and go through relatively quickly because 20 minutes seems much longer before you get up on stage. Um, so uh, as I mentioned first with Nathan Hunt, who is uh, the studio head of the collective, then Vic and Dotra, who used to be at Google. Uh, he was senior vice president, headed up Google Plus um, and other things. Ev Williams, of course, CEO of Medium, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square, and Danny Reimer, an investor partner at Index Ventures. So number one. <clears throat> find your one thing every day and be greedy with your time. Here's the thing. I think a lot of people have this thing that happens where if you're very busy, days go by, weeks go by, months go by, where you step back and go, okay, what did I accomplish? What did I build with my own hands? And I found myself in that position a lot. And one thing I noticed I saw Nathan doing, even though he ran the studio, was he would lock himself in his room for two, three hours a day and not come out. And what he was doing was he was coding. He was building something, right? And so I didn't realize until later that you have to force yourself. And one thing that I do every day is to stop and think, what do I want to accomplish today? What is important to me to build? And to be extremely greedy and to block off that time so that you can actually work on that thing. That means closing messages, closing your phone, everything. And it's very hard, but I promise you, if you do this every day, it will pay off. And it's something that I do with my team now at Postmates. Every morning, we have a stand-up. And I don't, you know, the normal stand-ups, people talk about what they do, what are they going to do, so on and so forth. Most people tune it out. We keep it to one thing, right? Think about the one thing that you want to do. And everyone says that. And then we get on with our day. Um, <laughs> so each one of these is going to transition in a different way. I was playing around with animations and keynote, and I never get, never get to do that. So that's a treat you have to look forward to. Um, so another thing is make it a simple matter of programming. Another thing that Nathan taught me, and this doesn't have to just be programming, but the thing is that what got me into this field was programming in general. I love building complex systems. I love the art of, of coding, and, and that's where I spent most of my time. But what's most important is that it's not that actual building that was the, the, the thing that, you know, that, that is the hard part. That's not the thing that you, know, you want to focus on most. It's actually what, what is, you know, you want to step back and think about, okay, what do you want to build, right? And this is a matter of proper planning and figuring out, is it the best thing that you want to build, the best thing, right? Because the programming or whatever you do, uh, your designer, programmer, whatever, that's, that is, it's the fun part, but it's also the easy part. Really, it's, you know, proper planning, stepping back and making sure that, you know, you know what you want to do and then you jump in and do that thing because that's, that's the easy part. Um, and so three. So there's a, there's a uh, Vic and Dotra at Google. Um, you know, he was there for a while. He was an am amazing orator. You watch him on stage. It's almost as if, you know, I get that, I, get that, I say this with love, uh, the used car salesman vibe, that kind of like someone who's just, he, you know, he's speaking right to you. And this is someone who set the tone at Google very well, at least within our company and with our team on Google Plus, which was, you know, he was able to, deliver bad feedback such as, or deliver harsh feedback such as, you know, we, you know, when Google Plus launched, it was great, but obviously it was an audacious goal to take on Facebook. And so every day there was, you know, we weren't achieving our goals, we weren't getting to where we wanted to be, but he was direct and he was kind about it and he didn't sugarcoat anything. And that was something that I was very much in awe of. And I try to take back to, you know, when you have a company, you're gonna have hardships, you're gonna have issues. You're gonna have problems. I take that back to my team and always remember that being direct and being succinct, succinct is extremely important because it leaves less room for error and it shows that you know, you're treating everyone like adults, right? Some of these are very obvious. <laughs> um, so this was something that took me a little while to learn. Again, Vic Gondotra. It's whenever possible, be the underdog. The underdog, or being the underdog, first of all, everyone roots for the underdog. But second, it forces you to have heart, right? At Google, we were on a mission to take down, I'm not supposed to, we weren't supposed to say that, to compete with Facebook, right? Um, and 
And, and, and people loved that. Like, it got a lot of, they, they seemed to understand it, right? We had a lot of users who came in. They loved our product. We knew we were fighting an uphill battle, but we loved being the underdog and, and, and those who were the, not the incumbent in the industry, right? Google is huge, and they're the best at search, but to have something where we weren't the best, it, it, it was inspiring, right? And, and Square was very similar in that way when PayPal would you know, shove, push and shove their way into our space, copy the Square Reader, things like that. But we stayed focused, did not you know, pay attention to the competitors, and just drive fast, right? Square would succeed in the end, Google Plus not so much. That's okay. I don't know what that was, but. Um, so we're gonna go on to Ev Williams. One thing is take pause. And there's two things that I learned from Ev, very important. He's an incredible thinker, right? When you're sitting in a meeting room with him, when he's talking, when he's faced with issues or complicated problems about a product, he knows how to stop and think and allow other people to stop and think. And even when he's talking, he takes pauses and breaks, right? This is a common thing when you're speaking. Pause for your listener. Pause for yourself to show that you're thinking. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. But over time, I've learned to trade myself, to teach myself how to do that. Because I want to talk fast. I want to move fast. I want to say a lot. I want to make sure I'm getting everything out there. But that's not very good for the listener. And the other thing is, one thing we did at Medium that I really enjoyed, that I was foreign to me, was we would take pause for ourselves. We had meditation <laughs> sessions uh, twice a day. Uh, this man would walk around with a bell and ding this bell, and you knew that it was time to go and meditate if you wanted to. Um, and I'd never done it before, but that was the benefits of doing that, of taking time where I'm not running from my thoughts, but I'm actually stopping and thinking, has been huge in my life. And it's something I do every day. Every single day, I must take at least 15 minutes for myself to stop and think, or else days are just flying by, and I'm not in control of, you know, of, of, I'm not checking in with myself. So look into that. Um, so we're going to move on to Jack. This is a common thing, right? Start small. Everyone says it. Um, we know why. Because if you start small, you're not going to overthink things. You're going to learn fast, hopefully. You're going to fail fast. And this is something that Square had in its mantra from day one. It's something that we practice every single day. And it's incredibly hard, especially as a founder. Uh, when you're building a company, you want to have all the right things in place. You want to have uh, you know, letters of intent. You want to have a revenue. You want to have a great team. You want to have a great idea. You want to be able to take all that to a, uh, to, uh, you know, a venture capitalist or, or someone and, and be able to show and demonstrate that you've thought about it all. Um, but really what this comes down to is, for me, and, and this was said, I believe, in the talk two talks ago, um, which is just to trust the process is what I call it, right? You start small, and you know that along the way, you're going to take steps, and you're going to figure out how to get to, you know, figure out how to be successful, but you cannot think about it, you know, right up front. And the one thing with that was Square Cash. Um, I remember at Square uh, walking up to Jack one day and, and saying, hey, you know, listen, pay by email. And he looked at me and, and he said, what, what are you talking about? And so it was this idea where you could actually just send money over email, right? It was, it was kind of a crazy idea, but we figured out how to do that technically. And today, Square Cash, obviously, it does Bitcoin. It does, it does a lot. It's a, it's a huge product. It's great. But we started extremely small. We didn't build a product. We just allowed you to send money over email. And we trusted that if we could build that up, we can get people used to that peer-to-peer -peer type of model. Then we can you know, start to build an app, start to figure out where it goes. And, and kind of go from there. And Square, I've seen, has done that with almost all of its projects, right? It's, and it's huge now. I mean, it's no surprise to me that it's a very successful company, even though this is part of its fabric. I don't know why they're going black, but. So number seven, again, Jack Dorsey, famous. Simplicity always wins. This is the hardest thing. At Google, I was taught, if you can manage complexity, you can be successful, right? Usually, you're building complex systems, for millions of users, you're, you're, that's just how Google was thinking, which is ironic because if you look at their, their, their main product all along, it's so simple, right? It's a screen, you type a thing in, and you get some other things. Um, but that's not the case. And, and at Square, again, it was all about simplicity. Can we take things down, boil it down to the essence, allow the technology to disappear, 
and just serve the customer, right? And so when it comes to your funding rounds, when it comes to talking to VCs, when it comes to, you know, essentially everything, keep things as simple as possible. Um, I cannot understate that, but that's also the hardest thing to do, is to simplify the complex. We're really going through these things here. <laughs> Number eight, uh, another one, is embrace the many founding moments. One thing that I learned is every company, you have one founding moment in the beginning, but there's several others that come along, right? When you make a key hire, it changes or shifts the way the company is thinking, or it, it causes a new inflection point, or you pivot your product, right? Because you've learned things along the way. These are all founding moments, and they don't all happen in the beginning. They can happen in the middle, even late stage, series D. Um, this is something that you want to look for and you want to embrace, right? Because be ready for those things to happen. And just, again, comes back to trusting the process. Ensure that you are always ready to, to, you know, to, to, to roll with these changes. Um, I think Square had several, several founding moments. You know, they started with Square Reader, and as we can see now, they've moved on to a whole ecosystem of products, which is, you know, ever since I left uh, back in 2013, is, has just been mind-blowing. Um, and, and, and I think that's because they were able to embrace these and encourage them. And then finally, uh, last one from Jack, who I've actually learned a lot from, was, of course, always keep the long view. I remember there was a time when Square when I was deciding to leave, I'd been leading Square Wallet and Square Cash. The consumer side, the VP of People was leaving, and so for the other key engineers. And just because, you know, it was that time, and, and, and I knew Jack was stressed, and I asked him, you know, how are you, how are you dealing with this? What, what is the thing? And of course, he just said, you know, always keep the long view. And the next thing he said, I'll never forget, is that, you know, Square will be as big as Twitter one day. And, and that blew my mind, right? I was, Square was valued at that time at three to four billion. Twitter was still pretty massive. And I just, I could not even see that, even though I, I believed him. And now we look today where he's CEO of both companies and things have gone well. He's kept that long view and, and they're both roughly around uh, the same valuation now, which is hugely impactful. Just when he sat there and said that to me and he believed that. And it's something that we should all Always keep in mind, especially when you know things go bad, or you're not, you don't get the funding that you want, or you know a, a competitor outpaces you. Just remember, you know, keep the long view, keep moving, and things will hopefully work out. Um, in ten, this was uh, uh, when I was building Secret. I kept a very heavy hand on the product. I was still coding every single day. I, if I were to leave that company. I believe that that company would not have been able to go on. And, and so the lesson here that I learned is to be successful when you are running your company. In the early days, this is hard, but you want to build a company that's bigger than you. If you leave, if you're the CEO or CTO or some founder, get in a situation where if you were to leave, the company is going to go on, right? It's bigger than any one person in the company. You want to make sure that you are set up to scale in that way. Uh, that is how, going back, how Jack is able to run Twitter and Square at the same time. He's built very strong teams, very strong leads. And that was Danny Reimer, my investor in secret when we were going through hard times. So last one, kind of last one, always be coding. This is something that actually is something that I say that I've learned, which is it may not be coding, but the thing that you do, the thing that got you into the industry, the thing that, you know, whether you're a designer or a coder or product manager, don't stop doing that thing, right? When I've gone into my career, I've wanted to, or I've been pushed to go into management, to stop coding, to spend time doing other things, one-on-ones, things like that. In my opinion, like push against that because I've done that before and it did not make me happy. Today, I lead a team of 35 people at Postmates, engineers, designers, analysts, product managers, and I still find time to code 46, four to six, four to five hours per day and make significant contributions. And that may not be the best use of my time, but it's what keeps me happy and it keeps me relevant and it keeps me with the team, which is where I need to be. And it's something that will always, always stick with me. I don't care, you know, CEO or not, it's the one thing that I need to keep and something to keep in mind. 12 to 14, don't write the title of your, uh, your, your, your talk first. Uh, 14 seemed like a good number when I first did the thing. 
And um, I got to 11, 10, and, and I figured that was too many. I'd be going too fast, which I have. So, you know, proper preparation. Thank you.